Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn, and it's a great surprise to see you here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Glenn is one of the pillars of the free church movement, uh, leading in all kinds of important ways, not least by hosting our Trinity students every March in Birmingham, uh, leading them through a painful part of our nation's past uh, as we keep working at issues of racial reconciliation in the Western Church. Glenn, so grateful for you, brother, for your leadership here in Florida. Uh, many churches, uh, many pastors, uh, both in your district and throughout the movement, are, are grateful for you. Um, Evie and Esther, thank you for the honor of bringing me here and having the privilege of speaking to my brothers and sisters here. Uh, you know, I did my dissertation work on Thomas traditions, uh, and uh, anyone who knows anything about the Apostle Thomas uh, knows that he made his way into Syria, and there's pretty good historical evidence, uh, more evidence than evidence against it, that um, he made it to India. And uh, so I can consider God's work in India to be the apostolic foundation of, of global Christianity. Uh, I'm glad that, uh, that the Indian church has allowed the Western church to be grafted on and uh, attached to the important work. And so it's, it's a privilege for me just to be here sharing God's word with you from Colossians. I know you've been getting Colossians last couple of days and you're deep in the text. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, read the passage, pray, and we'll get right into it. How about that? Okay. Let's start with Colossians chapter 1. Chapter, sorry, chapter 3, verse 1. If you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. And these, too, you once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Let's pray. Father, it's good to be here this morning. It's good to be with your people. Uh, I know that this community here has been gathered, huddled around Colossians, uh, diving deep into your word. And I'm certain, Lord, that they've been being that they've been blessed. And uh, my prayer is that uh, for my time, as um, as they listen to the foolishness of my preaching, that you would be able to speak, and that we would see you in a new way as a result of being fed by your word. Lord, this morning we give you the praise, we give you the glory, we give you the honor. Uh, we are so filled with joy that you have called us. Uh, not just servants, but brothers and sisters. And we rejoice in that today. Amen. The story is told of a young Indian girl who had an impairment in terms of speaking, an impairment in terms of hearing, and she was on a, a train from Pabani making its way to Amitabh, and she got off the train, and she was lost. And she tried to sign to people where she was going, and no one understood quite what was going on. She was an Indian girl, but somehow they got in her mind that she was Pakistani, and so they ended up putting on her train, headed for Lahore, and this 11-year-old girl could not communicate to anybody that she was really from India, and now she had been separated for, from her family, 
and couldn't communicate anything else. And so started spending her teenage years in Pakistani, in Pakistan, taking on Pakistani identity. Now the real challenge came when the when it was time for her to when she got integrated into a family and it was time for her to think about, well, are you going to get married? So they tried to arrange a marriage for her, and they found a nice boy for her, and it was all getting set, but she pulled out a map of India, put her finger on two eastern states in India, and pounded away, and refused to marry this Pakistani boy. What had happened, you see, was somehow she had been disconnected and eventually, when her case came before government authorities, they worked very rigorously to get her back reunited, to fig figure out who her family was um, back in India. And after a number of false starts, by the time she was 24, maybe you guys remember this story, she was finally reunited to her family. And though her name was, uh, was Geet in Pakistan, turned out her real name was Radha. And she had to re redefine her whole identity all over again, because she had come home. When Paul writes to the Colossians, he's writing about issues of identity. He's writing to a people who have been tied up in syncretism, tied up in false philosophy, tied up in the worship of angels. And the root problem, not was what they were doing, the root problem was that they did not really understand their identity in Christ. And so in this passage in Colossians 3, 1 to 11, what Paul is doing is he's drawing attention to the importance of the work of Jesus Christ. And the reason why this is so important, both for the Colossians and for us today, is if you don't really grasp what God in Jesus Christ has done for you, has done for us, then you will never turn the corner in understanding your identity and what, what kind of behaviors and actions and attitudes need to result from that identity. Because of Christ's work, we have to put on a new self in Christ. I have three points this morning. I want to work top, from top to bottom in this passage. And the first point is simply this, is because Christ has died, we have to put on a new self. I want to start back at the end of Colossians chapter 2 because, again, you know, as you read scriptures, you guys know this. Context is so important, and the worst thing you can do when you're handling scripture is, to, is just to isolate passages out of context. So I'm going to start in verse 20 of Col Colossians 2. I know this has already been covered, but I'm going to read it again. Paul says this, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why as if you were still alive to the world, do you submit to its regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that are, uh, will perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have an indeed appearance of wisdom in provo promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. A great deal of ink has been spilt in New Testament scholarship, anyway, over the nature, nature of the Colossian heresy. For no, a number of years, scholars would say the Colossian heresy had something to do with Gnosticism. The scholarly opinion has moved away from that view to say, no, it's some kind of syncretistic religion that involves some combination of Phrygian folklore, worship of angels, and Greek philosophy, all mixed in together in a homemade religion. That might make sense to us, because I think we live in a culture in the West, and probably as much as so in India, 
where religion is a little bit of a do-it-yourself. There's frameworks and there's pieces, but a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of throwing it all together. And the Colossians were doing the same thing. They were creating rules. They were indulging in philosophy, and they thought that this philosophy, if we had the right philosophy, it's going to save us. And so we have to keep that in mind uh, because part of what was current in Greek philosophy at the time maybe the most prevalent form of philosophical discourse on the street was not Platonism, but Stoicism. Stoicism, which said that you can transcend the sufferings of this world by appeal to this eternal rational order, this logos that's floating out there, and and not just for the Stoics, but also for the Platonists. There was a sense that if you sought the higher heavenly orders, and if you contemplated the stars, there would be some sense in which that transcendent order would uh, of, of reason, of logic, of rationale, of, of permanence as opposed to transitoriness would shape the way you think and that you would eventually think like God. So the contemplation of stars, which is tied in with angel worship, was a value for many people in the first century. And I have to think that when Paul says, uh, when he says, set your mind on things that are above, what, his, what he's doing is he's saying, look, for many of you, you're used to being told you need to contemplate, imbibe, drink, and focus in on philosophical principles of rationality, of reason, of transcendence, whatever that might mean. And Paul's putting forward a counter-narrative to saying you might think that reason might save you. You might think this this transcendental reference point might be the key for a life lived well. But I'll tell you what the truth is. If you're going to set your minds on anything, set your minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You notice that between verses 1 and 2, the the, the first verb is seek the things. Zetao, the second word is set your minds on the things. Uh, Froneo. And again, this is what religionists of the day would do, is seek that which is transcendent. Seek that which is higher. Seek that which is going to help you explain life. And Paul says the only way you can explain your life The only compass you need is to set your mind where Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Instead of pointing to the stars, he points to the image of the enthroned Jesus Christ. Now, mind you, when Paul's writing Colossians, it's unlikely that the Gospels were written at this point, or maybe they're just being written at this point. Uh, They didn't have the stories, at least in written form, of Jesus' ascension, but they knew the fact that Jesus was resurrected and risen. Paul told them as much in his gospel. Paul gives them an image, but not just an isolated image. He also gives them a narrative, and here's what I mean by that. When you take this, this phrase, the right hand of God, And you take this contrast between the things that are above and the things, verse 2, that are epites gaze on the earth. I have to believe that Paul has not just an image in mind, but he has certain texts in mind. Keep one finger in Colossians and turn with me, if you would, to Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, very familiar passage, you all know it. When Daniel has this dream of the vision of the four beasts and the four beasts coming out of the sea, and these four beasts represent the four kingdoms, and Daniel is weighed down by the, the weight of these kingdoms, and he sees the, the, these kingdoms and these beasts being given over to judgment. And then verse 13, the key pivotal point in the whole book of Daniel, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. 
And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all nations, peoples and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me. And I approached uh, the ones who of uh, those who stood there with me and asked the truth about this. And he told me and made me known the interpretation of these things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall rise out of the earth. And the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. And, it, and I won't, we don't have time to go into all this, but when you read through Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8, this phrase, epitase gates in the Septuagint, on the earth, on the earth, on the earth, is tied in with the four kingdoms. The difference between the kingdom of the Son of Man and the kingdom of, of the world is that the kingdoms of the world are epitase gates. They're on the earth. The most basic cosmic battle that we've ever involved in is this battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. And if you don't believe Daniel chapter 7, think about Psalm 110. In Psalm 110, you have this same pairing of concepts where you have the things that are the, the vision that's above with the things that are taking place on the earth. We know that the early Christians paired together Daniel 7 and Psalm 110 all the time. And this is a psalm about Melchizedek. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand and he will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, fill them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. Epitas gates on the earth. Friends, what I'm getting at here is I think what Paul is doing is he's not just saying, I want you to imagine Jesus being seated. Yes, there is that, but he's drawing us back to a story. The story that's told in Daniel chapter 7, the story that's told in Psalm 110, and it's a perspective story of what God is about to do and is doing through the risen Christ. He's executing judgment against the nations and establishing his kingdom. What that means is that if you are in Christ, if you have been raised with Christ, Paul says, I want you to conform your mind and the focus and the orientation of your heart in a way that's keeping with your kingdom participation. That kingdom, the things of this earth, belongs to the kingdoms of the world, and those kingdoms are doomed. Those philosophies, those ideologies, they're doomed. They're not going anywhere. Which side are you on, Paul is saying? Are you on the side of the earth, or are you on the side of the, the Son of Man who is above? Now, why is Paul focusing on all this? Because he knows that those things that we spend time thinking about, those times that we're, those ideas that we're preoccupied about, when we're brushing our teeth at night and our mind wanders, where does it go to? Paul says, where you put your attention is going to have everything to say about your participation in this kingdom. Paul says, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Why? For you have died. You've died. And you say, well, how, how did we die? Well, that's easy because we go back to Colossians chapter 2. You guys have already covered all this. Uh, it says this, uh, in, starting in verse 11, you've been circumcised with a circumcision of chapter 2, made without human hands, and this has ha occurred by putting off the body of the flesh. And you've been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, you were dead in the trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, and God, you made you together alive with Christ by canceling the record of debt that stood against us. 
So Paul, at the beginning of Colossians 3, is just recapitulating what he's already said in Colossians chapter 2, and that is when Jesus Christ died on the cross for us so over 2,000 years ago, it wasn't just him that died that day. If you're in Christ, you died that day too. Everything about you died. Oh, yes, you're alive physically. Your heart's still beating. Your, your brain still has a wave. But everything about you, everything else died when Jesus cried out with his last breath. That means all your will, all your passions, all your hopes, all your dreams, all your commitments, everything about you has been killed. Put to death by Jesus Christ crucified on the cross. Paul puts it this way in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Francis Schaeffer would like to say that in his Bible, whenever he came to Galatians 2.20, he draw two bold lines right after saying, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. He did that because he knows we have a tendency to rush on ahead to saying, but Christ lives in me. No, 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 you have to slow down. You have to stop. And you say, no, I've been crucified, and I no longer live. I've already had my funeral. Everything that's about me and my kingdom and my desires and my preferred lifestyle, everything that I want is completely irrelevant because I'm a dead person. And that happened with Christ on the cross. So because Christ died, and because we're in Christ, we've died. And any life that we have, Paul tells us in verse 3, is now hidden with Christ in God. Now, Paul goes on to talk about the implications of all this. He's, in verse 5, he says, okay, if that's true, put to death, therefore, translation I like, for the Greek verb here is allow to die, therefore, everything that is earthly in you. Let put to death, therefore, all the body parts. The, the, Greek, the Greek noun here is melee, parts of the body. All the prosthetic devices that are in your body, put them to death. And what do these include? Well, we have, a, we have a list here that we could probably spend an hour on each of these items. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Let me focus on a few of these. And let me focus on a few of these within the framework of one of the biggest changes to our mental man landscape in the past generation. That is the rise of social media. Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you, and that includes sexual immorality. We are steeped in our culture in sexual immorality. You can't open a magazine. You can't open a news source. You can't turn on the Internet. You can hardly watch a television show or, or a movie on Netflix without images, highly sexualized images, and, and values which say that your, what you do with your body has absolutely no moral bearing whatsoever. What you do with your body is an obligation. You are not fully human, our culture tells us, at least our Western culture tells us, until you've, you've developed yourself sexually. True identity, true coming into being uh, is impossible without sexual expression. And as a result, we push our younger people to, toward sexual activity. Our culture does sooner and sooner. Those who have not participated in sexual activity are seen to be less than human. So that sexuality itself has become a kind of God. And we get that, and you can say, I'm a Christian, I don't believe that, but you're in a culture where the system works completely different. 
And Paul is saying, you have to let that die. Christ put it to death. Our culture is trying to keep that alive in you. Make choices, therefore, that are going to be consistent with putting it to death. Paul mentions not just sexual immorality, but passion. Thumas. When I think of passion, and I think the way that passion, the word thumas is often used, it has to do with anger. And when you think about it, and you think about social media, have you ever stopped to think about how important anger is in perpetuating the social media industry? You get on the far left, uh, politically left-leaning stations, and you watch for a while, and you realize what's going on. The newscasters, they don't want to give you the news. They want to make you angry. And they want to get the crowds ginned up, and, you, and it's intoxicating, and you want to keep tuning back in because you, you just want to share the anger. And if you turn into the far right-wing stations, they're doing the exact same thing. They don't care about imparting information. They want to make you angry because if you can be angry, they know you'll tune back in because you need someone to share that anger with. And so not just the news, but so much of social media is geared as clickbait to appeal to your passion, your propensity to be angry. And there's so much that goes on these days that's driven not by reason, not by dialogue, not by good intention, but simply by anger. Paul says, because you've been put to death, you need to put to death anger. And those things that you're exposed to that feed that anger, Watch yourself, Paul says. Have the self-awareness to know this is not healthy for me to watch, this is not healthy for me to read, because it has a way of hooking me in and making me angry. There are things worth getting angry about. I'm not saying we go through life you know, as zombies. But there's a the righteous, there's an anger of, of man, James tells us, and there's a, a righteousness of God. And I think the church would be far better served if we were able to disconnect a little bit and spend less time being angry and more time focusing on things above. Paul also says this, put to death whatever is earthly in you, and that includes covetousness, which is the same thing as idolatry. What's difficult about this is we, li we live in a capitalistic system which is driven by advertising, and the way advertising works is it advertising inherently wants to make you covetous. It wants you to envy what you don't have. It wants you to see your life as empty until you're filling in that missing product, that missing piece, that missing lifestyle, that cool that you've always been looking for. And so everything about our culture, is, to the extent that it's market-driven and advertising-driven, it appeals to covetousness and feeds covetousness and wants you to be hungry all the time. The problem about being hungry all the time is you're never full. And so people who struggle with covetousness are never satisfied. Paul says, let's think no bones about it. Covetousness is simply idolatry. And there are times when you're, you're rolling with friends and you say, boy, they have a nice car. I wish, I wish I could afford a car like that. Or visiting someone in their house and you, you say, boy, you, they have such a nice house. I'll, we'll never have, have a house like that. I wish I had a house like that. Or, and the list can go on and on and on and on. And what this means for us, very realistically, is a level of self-awareness. Because where you feel that urge, where we, we feel ourselves 
coveting and envying and saying, I wish I had this, and why this, she has this, why can't I have that? He has this, why can't I have this? What that means is there's an idolatry bubbling away somewhere in your soul, and Paul's saying, you have an opportunity now. Now that you've identified it, put it to death. Repent of it, let it go, give it to God. By your own efforts? No. The first step is recognize you're already dead. It doesn't make sense for a dead man to have passions. It doesn't make sense for a dead person to have lust. It doesn't make sense for a dead woman to be coveting something. Because when you're dead, you're dead. Therefore, put it to death. About five years ago, there was a man named Aaron Ralston who was backpacking in Utah, and he was climbing rocks. And he was by himself, and he had some burritos and his backpack and water because it was a couple-day journey. And as he's climbing the rocks, he, he was going through this one, one rock, and he stuck his hand in, and the rock kind of went back and forth, and it just stuck there. The only problem was, was that his hand, his, his forearm was stuck behind the rock. So he kind of, you know, he's got to kind of jiggle it loose, and it wasn't coming loose. And he pulled it some more, and it was stuck. That his, his arm was completely pinned by this boulder. That was day one. Day two goes by. He's in the middle of nowhere, just pinned pinned by this boulder. Day three goes by. He's, he's rationing his water. He's almost out of water. He's eating his last burrito out of his backpack. His arm is turning blue and starting to get decrepit with the rock because it, the, the blood is all cut off. Day four, he starts getting delirious. Day five, he pulls out a little multi-pack of tools, including screwdrivers, pliers, and a pocket knife with a little blade like this. Cuts off his sleeve and starts sawing his forearm off. And he works at it for about half an hour, and then he takes the pliers out and then starts pulling the tendons off his own arm. Must have been an hour of excruciating pain and intense willpower. But he knew that unless he amputated his own arm, he was going to be dead. And finally, he was, able to, he was able to manage to cut his whole forearm off. He rappelled down a, a steep 65-foot wall, walked six miles on the road before him being picked up by a family, rushed to a hospital. They came back weeks later, moved the boulder, retrieved his arm, and then... Um, the, then cremated the arm and gave, <laughs> gave him his arm back in, in the form of ashes. You know, in a sense, when Paul says, put to death the parts of your body that are, need to be put to de death, we have the same decision that Aaron had to make. We can say, no, I, I, I need this sin as part of my life, and I'm not willing to cut it off. Or we make the decision now to say, I know this is, this is my right arm. But if I'm going to live, the only way I can live is by cutting this off. Put to death, therefore. Why? Because Christ has died and we are with Christ. But there's the second thing that God has done in Jesus Christ, and that's Christ is renewing us. Go with me now to verse 7. In these two you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. So Paul, in verse 10, is talking about the old self, or the old anthropos, the old man, and then there's the new anthropos, or the new man, just as he does in Ephesians. And he says, look, You've already put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
God has us in a process of ongoing renewal day by day. Renewal, making new, is a creative activity. It's a resurrection activity. It's an activity that demands God's power because only God can do it. And God is imposing that power right now on each of our bodies. Now, there's a paradox here, and the paradox is spelled out most explicitly in other places in Paul's writings, namely in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4, Paul goes on great length about the glory that's revealed uh, in his own suffering. And starting in 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says this, And we all with unveiled faces, that is, we apostles, we behold the glory of the Lord, and we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of a glory to another. For all this comes from the Spirit. But then he goes on, shift over to 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, where he talks about this treasure in jars of clay to show that this transforming power, surpassing power, belongs to God and not us. We're inflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we are always give, being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh, so that death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. What Paul is saying is there's a great paradox here with the Christian life, and that is you, if you are really interested in God's renewal work in your life, if you're, real, if you're really wanting to be conformed to the image of his son, there's a price to pay. And that price, my friends, is suffering persecution, social exclusion, but all kinds of things that you can't control that will come your way. And God is going to use these painful events for your renewal. And that's the price. Now, Paul has spelled that out very clear, clearly in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, but he also says something very close to this early in the book of uh, Colossians itself, because in Chapter 1, verse 24, remember how Paul says this, now I rejoice in my suffering for you. Isn't that weird that he says, I rejoice in suffering for you? But he rejoices in suffering for your sake. And in my flesh, I'm still filling up what is lacking in regards to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body. That is the church. Paul is saying, it's important that I suffer. Why? For your guy's sake. Because the more I suffer, the more God is renewing me and the more glory is shining, and that's going to have dividends for you. That's commitment to the church. That's commitment to the people of God. I am so concerned about the people of God that I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing for God to break me and close me in and hem me in and all kinds of difficulties for the sake of the church. And maybe in your life even now, God is leading you through a passage of great and immense pain and difficulty. And take heart, my friends. The reason he is doing that is because he's preparing to use you for the sake of the church. And he's using you even now. Because he's renewing you in ways you can't even see. It's not even visible to you. But God will use that for his glory. Going back to Colossians 3.10, he says, You, my Colossian brothers and sisters, you've already put on a new man, and it's being renewed, and he says this, unto knowledge. Being renewed unto knowledge. Now, that's important for the Colossians to know because they were all about knowledge. They loved the book study. They wanted, they wanted to be into the Greek philosophers. They wanted a little bit of this, a little bit of Plato, a little Stoicism, a little angel worship. They had it all figured out, and Paul's saying, okay, if you want knowledge, I'll give you knowledge. Here's how knowledge begins. Is it starts with the process of sanctification, of Christ getting a hold of you, renewing you as you expose yourself to him day by day through worship, and he's renewing you, and there's no better foundation for true knowledge than that. You know, some of our friends here will know who are with Trinity. 
they'll know that I, I talk tirelessly and maybe t- ad nauseum about our three strategic priorities at Trinity, uh, w- worship and faithfulness, mentor and hope, and build bridges and love. The reason why I feel it's important that we articulate worship and faithfulness is because not some people think that knowledge can be obtained apart from worship, and I really don't think it can. Facts, isolated facts can be obtained apart from worship, but if we are, if we are Christian thinkers, you cannot really understand anything at all unless you understand it in relationship to the work of God in Christ. And in order to understand that, that's not just an int- uh, intellectual proposition or intellectual reality. That begins with worship. And as, w- as Cam and I were coming in and you were worshiping, part of what God does through that worship is he prepares you for true knowledge for grasping reality as it really is. See, the, the problem with education, so much education these, these days, is that it's, is we get isolated sound bites and facts without a comprehensive framework, without a totalizing whole in which to put the pieces in. Paul says that in order to have that, you have to be renewed. It's not just mental. It's not an idealism but it's a way of life. There is no better school than the school of Christ. Seeing that you put off the old self, you're being renewed unto knowledge. Next phrase says this, after the image, or according to the image of its creator. And isn't that what God has been about all the time? Isn't this, doesn't this take us right back to Genesis? where God said, let us make man in our own image. And he put Adam in the garden as the image, as as his representative on earth. And God says to Adam, Adam, you're my God. You're my representative. You develop the kingdom of God right here in the garden. And as my image, reflect who I am. Whatever I would do, do it that way. And carry out your role as the caretaker of creation, just as I would on my behalf. Adam, stake space out on behalf of who I am. And many, many, many years later, when Jesus would appear on the scene and he'd say, I can only do what I see my father doing, he's announcing he's the image. And that Jesus' calling was to be the true image, where Israel failed to be the image Jesus said, I am the image. Paul says as much here in Colossians. He says it elsewhere in Romans. He is the true image. And now because we are grafted into Christ and we are in Christ, we participate in that image. We as the body of Christ are that image. And the most important calling that we can have, brothers and sisters, is to be that image. It's not even to spread the gospel. It's to be the image. It's not what we do. It's not the great things that we perform. It's not our achievements. It's not the articles I, I write or languages, and I know that doesn't matter as long as we, we be the image together. And in the, in the church of God of Jesus Christ, what we have to do is attend much more closely to the question, how are we imaging God to the world? And how are we allowing God to speak into our reality? so that we can be a billboard for Jesus Christ. God cares so much about you and me that he's determined to put you through nearly anything in order to conform you to his image. The question for us is, are are you willing to pay that price? On the way over this morning, we were, put, we were going a little late because we realized that uh, the University of Florida was having its graduation and all the streets were tied up with traffic. We were coming from uh, the house of the president of the University of Florida, who's a Trinity alum, and spent a couple days with him. And uh, we stayed in what he called the Gator Room. And in the Gator Room, you can imagine it's all orange and, and, and blue, but there's posters of University of Florida athletes, and University of Florida has some famous athletes. And I'm thinking, 
as I'm sitting there in the Gator Room, with what, like these posters of these young people from you know, women's volleyball, football, basketball, swimming, you name it. They've, if there's a sport, it's at University of Florida. And I'm thinking, wow, how many posters do they have of this football player, this, this name image likeness of, of this person, this athlete? And what, what the Gator Room is, is for the president, it's his glory room. He's saying, this is, this is how good we are. So here are all the images. Here are these embodiments of University of Florida. These are the Gators. That's why we call it the Gator Room. You know what God is doing? God's church is his Gator Room. And he's got these name images of likeness. And the, the thing is, is we all look like Jesus. And his strategic plan for the cosmos is to scatter us throughout the world as him in, his image. And if he is able to accomplish that, then he is satisfied. Our mission isn't just to win souls, friends. Our image is to lead people so that they're conformed to the image. It's not just conversion. It's discipleship into the image. And that's, that only is achieved by renewal. I'm running out of time here, so, but we got one last point, And that is Jesus is coming back. Christ died. Christ is renewing us, but because Christ is coming again, that's another reason we have to put on the new self. I'm, let's go back to the top of the passage. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, with Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things of the earth, for you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Do you see that in verse 4? When Christ, who is the only source of your life, when he appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now, here's how this works. Because we've died and our only life is hidden with Christ in God, our life is hidden in Jesus' human life, but we know about what we know about Jesus. Is he just isn't fully man, but he's also fully God. And because of our attachment to the human Jesus, we're also attached to the divine Jesus. And in this process, we become divine. We participate in the divine nature. And this is the reason why we will appear with him in glory. Glory has to do with divinity. Adam lost the glory because back in the Eden. And now, because of Christ, we get the glory back. So there's two things to keep in mind about Christ's coming and why we have to put on our renewed selves in light of Christ's coming. One is the fact of glory. First John tells us, no eye has seen, or, or uh, we do not yet know what we'll be when Christ returns. But we know that when we see him, when he appears, well, sh we shall become like him. In an instant, when we see Christ, we become transformed. And when it comes to issues of identity, who you become in the end, where it's all going, is the ultimate indicator of identity. We're all on a journey. And that journey is ending in the same place. And so Paul is saying to the Colossians and he's saying to us today, keep your eyes on the future. Keep your eyes on what one day you will become when Christ appears. Because if you really nail that down in your heart and mind, that's going to change everything that you do. It's going to change the way you think about all these things that Paul talks about in verse 8, about anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk, those, those things, they don't even work, Paul says. And the other thing he says is, I don't want you to lie to each other. Do not lie to one another. Because Why? Because you've put on the new self. But here in this new reality in verse 11, there is no Greek, n no Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave free. Christ is all in all. And it made me wonder when I read this passage 
Why is it that Paul focuses on lying when he says, do not lie to one another? And then he goes on to talk about being Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised. Have you ever wondered that if you've read this passage before? I've wondered it. And here's the thing. Paul knows that one day we're going to end up being transformed into quasi-divine beings. Not sure how to explain that all. I'm not a systematic theologian, so I don't want to get in trouble. But Paul says that's the overriding reality. And it seems to me the issue of, of ethnic identity or social identity or political identity is tied in with, with the, the sin of lying in this way. It's because sometimes we often lie uh, because we're not true to who we are. We're embarrassed about who we are. Or we're trying to leverage, or we're trying to gain ground, or we're trying to maneuver for our own self-interest and our self-identity. And Paul's saying, why are you doing that? If you're a Jew pretending to be a Gentile, why are you doing that? If you're a Gentile pretending to be a Jew, why are you doing that? If you're a barbarian pretending to be someone else, so many people in our culture struggle with their ethnic identity because they're trying to figure out where they fit in. And I understand that. But there's a reality in a, that Paul is also drawing our attention to that says, keep in mind, when Christ came, he flattened that out, not utterly obliterated. Identity matters. Color is important. Ethnicity is important. Our, 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 our roots are important. They're not unimportant. But they're qualified by the arrival of Jesus Christ. And our fundamental passport, our fundamental identity, is the kingdom of God. And if that is not your reality, and if that's not the reality for those in the church, we are all in trouble. What we need is a church that says all the differences that we have here, whatever parts of the country co we come from, whatever parts of the world we come from, whatever we look like, whatever we like to eat for dinner, at the end of the day, none of that matters because Christ is all and in all. And when Christ arrives in glory, that's going to be completely clear. So we don't have to pretend. We don't have to lie. We don't have to deceive each other. When you know who you are, you can be completely honest. Therefore, do not lie to each other. But the, the other reason that Paul talks about is, is not just glory, but he says this, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. At the end of verse 6, on account of sexual immorality, on account of passion, on account of evil desire and covetousness, because of all this stuff, all this junk, the wrath of God is coming. And I'm stopping to underscore that because I, I was just listening to a podcast yesterday by two gentlemen who self-identify as evangelicals, and they're making fun of the concept of hell. And they're saying, God would never send people to hell. And, and they're mocking Christians who believe in the, in the idea of conscious eternal, uh, eternal conscious torment. Now, we'll find out one day. But to me, the scriptures are very clear. The wrath of God is a reality, and it's worth talking about in motivating Christian ethics. Paul mentions it here. And the reason why that's important is there's, there's two things we need to keep track of. We need to track of who we'll become. We also need to keep track of the reality is for all our sin, all our junk, the stuff we indulge in, there should be a little voice that goes off in our head that says, because of this, you know, the wrath of God is coming. And that wrath is severe. But Paul points us forward, and he says this, going back to verse 4, when Christ who is with you with life appears, you also with it will appear with him in glory. And I just want to close on that verse because it's such a beautiful verse. And it made me think of a time where our family was going to see uh, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and Yitzhak Perlman, the famous violinist, was playing. And the conductor of the, of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, at the end of the concert, calls Yitzhak Perlman to stand up front and to bow with his violin, and the crowd goes crazy, cheering him on, and Yitzhak Perlman points back to the conductor 
and the conductor points back to Yitzhak Perlman. They're pointing to each other, and I think that's actually a little bit of a picture of what will happen when we appear with Christ. Is Christ will point to us and saying, behold the glory, and we will point back to him and saying, behold the glory, and the angels will be applauding. And Paul says, you know what? Think about this, my caution friends. Because Christ died for us, because Christ is renewing us, because Christ is coming again, aren't those ample reasons enough to be diligent in allowing yourselves to be transformed? When I think back to Radha, the story of Gita, who found out she was actually Radha, or was actually finally called Radha, and every time they wanted to, to keep her in Pakistan and, and marry her off to someone in Pakistan, she would point back to the map. This is who I am. This is where I belong. And what we need now more than ever, brothers and sisters, is Christians who resolutely say, I am not about the things of the earth, but I am about the things of the Christ. And we keep pointing our finger in that reality and leading others to do the same. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you have done so much for us, and we so weakly grasp the reality of this transfer that you've brought about for us. Father, I pray that you would open up our eyes, that you open up our ears, that we could really grasp the change of identity and then begin day by day to live into that identity. Help us, Lord, not to forget who we are. Help us to to set aside those things that will confuse us in terms of our identity. Help us as a people of God to be consistent. Give us the grace to be that image that you're longing for. We pray that, that you do this in our lives by your power.